1763, uh, something called the Royal Proclamation happened. Uh, it was uh, King George III who, uh, after seven-year war, sorry, seven-year war with France, uh, after they had uh, defeated them, uh, all of the land that France had in North America, they ceded to the British government. And so the, the Royal Proclamation was... Uh, King George basically telling the, the continent of North America how the lines were going to be drawn, where you were allowed to settle, where you were allowed to live, what you were allowed to do, because, well, it was his now royal rule over North America. For some people, this was a, a great time. It, it gave clear boundaries for where they could live. It gave them land to settle on and to colonize. It, it gave them these things uh, for, for some of the First Nations people, uh, it gave them freedom, actually, to, to rule themselves. Um, and they thought that this was going to be a great proclamation. And then there was other people who actually who hated it. Uh, it. It gave them boundaries that they weren't allowed to cross. It, it gave them places they weren't allowed to do business. It, it made them have to go through the British government for, for everything. So for some people, this, this royal proclamation led to, to life, it led to joy, it led to rejoicing. For, for others, it actually planted the seeds of rebellion. You know, 1776 is only 13 years removed from this royal proclamation, which is when uh, the, the 13 colonies uh, came together and they declared independence from the UK government. Uh, what some saw as a, as a gift, others saw as a curse. What some saw with rejoicing, others saw as uh, cause for rebellion. And the same thing is, is true of our, of our passage this morning. In, in 1 John uh, 1, 5 to 10, what we're going to see is that the apostles, they proclaim something true of God that should change our relationship with him, our understanding with him, and how we live in light of him. And for some people, this proclamation is something that is to be rejected. They, they would rather choose their own sinful proclamation. But for others, this is actually leads to salvation. And so those are our three big ideas for today. We have the apostles' proclamation. We have the, the sinful proclamation. And then we have uh, the saving proclamation. So if you have your Bibles, welcome you to, to open them. First John 1, uh, we're going to look at verses 5 to 10 this morning. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So why, why this? Of, of all declarations that John could make, of, of all the declarations that the apostles could make, Right, last week, we, we saw that, that John is trying to kind of tee up the ball for what is going to be true, what, what all of the apostles were witness to, what they saw, what they are declaring as right and true. The first thing that John chooses to say of, of, of everything is God is, is light. And there's a couple aspects that we want to look at and understand, but the, the first being, it's a statement of God's, of God's character of who he is, his identity. Light is this picture of, of holiness and perfection, of, of sinlessness, of purity. You know, in our culture, we, we get this, we see this. It's why a bride on, a, on, our, on her wedding day wears a, a white dress. It's why in, in temples or other religions, uh, white and, and light are, are symbols of, of purity and of righteousness, of, of goodness, and yet God is, is different than everything this world has to offer. All you have to do is go visit a temple years later and you can see that white marble that was so beautiful is, is starting to crack and is smudged and has soot and is dirty. It only takes until the, the dance to start noticing that that bride's dress is not as, as clean and, and crisp as it was. There's some, there's some dirt on it. There's some grass stains. There's, there's some ketchup where she spilled there's starting to be some perspiration around. It's not, 
it's not as pure and as, as, as perfect as it was at the beginning. But the same is, is not true of God. In fact, even the, the brightest thing in our solar system, the, the sun itself, a, a burning, boiling, bubbling ball of fire, when you take a picture of it, there's dark spots. God is not like that. And, and, and John's language in the passage is trying to convey not just that God is, is light, but there's no darkness at him, no darkness at all, not, not, not an ounce, not a bit, not a titch, not a smudge. There's nothing in his character or in his person that is sinful, that is morally deficient. There is nothing in him that is like us that way. No matter how long he is alive, no matter how long he rules, no longer what he does, there will never be a point where there is sin in him. And this is good news. See, John doubles down. He points to this. He circles back to it so that we get it. There is nothing about God's words or his actions, his thoughts, his plans, his purposes that are sinful, that are evil, that are morally corrupt or have the, the slightest tinge of error in them. He's perfect in all of his ways. This is what Deuteronomy 32.4 says. The rock, his work is perfect. For all his ways are justice, a God of faithfulness. Without iniquity, just and upright is he. This should give us great joy, right? There is a God who sits on the throne, who is in control of everything, who is perfect. Which means if he is perfect, perfect, then whatever he calls us to, whatever he asks us to do, whatever he says is true about us, we can trust. We can trust him with all things, with everything in our lives. That's this first picture that we're supposed to be getting. We can actually flourish and we can have salvation. We can know how to walk with him because he and everything he does is perfectly good. But the second aspect of, of light what it points us to is that he actually reveals what is true not only of himself to us, but what is true of us. He reveals our sinfulness. He reveals our inadequacy. He, he reveals where we are deficient, where, where we are lacking. And he doesn't just do that, but he actually reveals the way of salvation. He, he reveals how we can live and how we should live with him. When God shows up to Moses in the burning bush, we see this light and we see this call, we see this, this clarity. When he shows up to the Israelites with a pillar of fire or on Mount Sinai with peals of thunder and lightning and fire, there, there is a revelation that God is different and other. He is not like us. And yet he welcomes us to walk with him. And he shows us how we can do that. I mean, look at what he says about himself and about the law. In, in Psalm uh, 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. 2 Samuel twenty two twenty nine. 29, for you are my lamp, O Lord, and my God lightens my darkness. Or in John 18, 12, and again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The picture that we're supposed to get that's conjured up in our minds is not only that the character of God is perfect and true, but he lights the way to salvation and right living. This is good news for us. I mean, some of us have struggled, though, as we look at God and we look at the plans and we look at the purposes, we look at our lives and we struggle to trust that he actually is he's perfect. He, he's good in all of his ways, that everything is for our, our good. This is actually what C.S. Lewis's pushback was for, for not believing in God. He, he just couldn't make sense of the world that he saw with the God that he was supposed to be in relationship with. This is what he said. He said, my argument against God was that the universe seemed cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing the universe with when I called it unjust? The more he looked at God and he came to understand who God was, his character, his purposes, he was able to actually submit and, and follow God fully. And the same is, is true of us. This is why John starts where he starts. This is the, the, the foundational truth for the rest of the book. If we can agree and we can understand and we can accept who God is, 
well, then we can accept what God calls us to. We, we, we can accept what God tells us is true of ourselves. We must think rightly of God because his identity clears up our own. We must think of God rightly because his holiness and his perfection shows us that as sinners, we are rightly kept away from him. But because of his character, he can reveal our sinfulness, the way to salvation, and how to live with him. How have you been thinking of God? What is true of, of his plans and his purposes? What's, what's true of how he speaks and acts? I wonder if not, uh, we struggle sometimes with our own, our own pride, thinking that we know better, or, or our own selfishness, that we want things our way, with envy and impatience, and it taints actually who God is and what he does. Sometimes we act as, as judge over what God does rather than seeing that what God says of himself, what the, the apostles have been witness to is that he is perfect in all of his ways. John could have started anywhere. Could have started with the transcendence of God. He's, he's, he's beyond us. He could have started with the, the omnis, right? Omnipresent, omnipotent. Uh, he could have started with, with how God is all powerful and all knowing and he's everywhere all at once. He could have started with the unknowability of God. That There's only so much we can grasp. He could have started anywhere with something like the compassion, the love, the mercy, the grace, the forgiveness of God, and yet he starts here because it is the foundation for everything else to rest on. So first off, what we have to come and have to see is, is John is trying to tell us that God is holy and evil has no place beside him. And this is why John is so incensed in, in, in the rest of our passage with these sinful proclamations that are made these sinful beliefs and heart positions because not only do they keep us from experiencing salvation, but they actually, they make God out to be a liar. They, they attack his own character. So these sinful proclamations are heart attitudes or beliefs that will keep us from saving faith in Jesus. And what are they? Look at verse six with me. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie. We do not practice the truth. Well, that's the first one. Then jump down to verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And then down to verse 10. If we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. If we say we have fellowship with God while well, we are actually fellowshipping with darkness, this, this first proclamation says we're actually just liars and we do not practice the truth. And we can substitute a different word there or different ideas to help us understand what John is trying to say. If we have fellowship uh, with God, will we fellowship with the darkness? Or will we walk, if we say we walk in the light, will we walk in darkness? Or if we say we practice the truth, but we are actually practicing sin, we lie, and we do not practice the truth. See, John sees this claim that they're making, and immediately he starts poking big holes in it. He sees their claim, but then looks at their lifestyle and goes, it doesn't matter what you, what you say if your walk doesn't line up with it. You, you can say anything you want, but if you, if you can't actually do it, it doesn't matter. See, John, as we get further into chapter 2, we're going to see exactly what it is he's talking about, what it means to walk in the darkness. I'm just going to throw it up on the screen, and you can read them through with me. But he basically says, we cannot walk in the light if we don't keep God's commandments, right? 1 John 2, 4. If we don't walk like Jesus, 1 John 2, 6. If we hate our brothers, 1 John 2, 9 and 11. If we love the world, if we've not maintained fellowship with the church, or if we deny that Jesus is the Christ. See, this is a reminder that John is not speaking to people out there. He, he's speaking to people in here. People who are claiming to be in fellowship with God. People who are claiming to be saved. People who are claiming to be followers of Jesus. And yet they're walking in, in darkness. It's pretty easy to see why he is so incensed at these these proclamations. See, if we say we have fellowship with God who is holy and perfect and just, but we continue to not walk in darkness, it's, it's, it's impossible. We're, we're just lying to ourselves. 
Now we're talking about the difference between living in a sinful world and still trying to put sin to death versus claiming to be a follower of Jesus yet choosing to continue to walk in sin and darkness. It, it would be like if I told my wife, I'm, I'm going to walk up to the store and grab some milk. I'll be home in 15 minutes. If I came home in 15 minutes with a jug of milk, she would not be surprised. And, and if while I was walking, there was a couple puddles that I maybe stepped in, maybe somebody didn't clean up after their dog. If I, if I got home in 15 minutes, my wife wouldn't be too confused about what happened. She might wonder, why weren't you looking where you're walking? I have to smell that now. But she wouldn't be confused. However, if I, if I came home 45 minutes after I told her I'm, I'm going for milk, but instead of walking up the, the well-lit road that is, is paved and clean and nice, I decided to, to try to take a shortcut. And, and I, I went through the farmer's field. And I got snagged on the barbed wire because there was no light and I wasn't really paying attention to what I was doing. And, and I crawled through some blackberry bushes. And if I got home and the jug of milk had a hole in it and I was cut and bruised and bleeding, my wife would rightly say, where were you walking? What, what, what happened? Or it would, be, it, would, it would make sense if somebody told you they were going to go do the Tough Mudder. I don't even know if that's a thing anymore. But if they were going to go do the Tough Mudder, and, and they got back and they were covered in mud, their shirt, their pant, everything is just kind of torn up and cut. They got a big smile on their face. They got their new shirt on uh, saying, like, I did it, right? You wouldn't be surprised. That makes sense. You, you told me that's what you were doing. But if somebody came home from Tough Mudder, and they had no dirt, they had no water, they had no milk, they had nothing on them, they had no cuts, no bruises, and their shirt was still nicely, like, pre you know when they pull it right out and it still has the lines in it? You would wonder, I thought you said you were going to go do the Tough Mudder. The point is the same for, for both of these. If you're saying you're walking in the light, your life should look like it. If you say you're walking in the light, but you're you're walking in the darkness, you're just lying to yourself. So which is it? Are, are, are we walking in the light? Are we walking in the darkness? Our, our claims should be evidenced by our walk. And if we claim to walk in the light, our lives should look increasingly like the life of Jesus. Not, not perfect, not sinless in every way, but, but we should be wanting to put sin to death. We should be wanting to, to be more and more like Jesus and be more and more with Jesus. It's the process of being sanctified, of God's Spirit working in our hearts to make us more like Him. But what life are you claiming? Are, are you claiming to walk in the light? Does anybody know about this claim around you? Do, do people in your life know that you are claiming to follow Jesus? And when you think of your life, what does it reveal about your claims? Are there, are there people who question why you're, you're constantly angry? Are there people questioning why, why you're always filled with, with lustful thoughts or, or coarse joking? Are there, are there people who question What's really going on in your walk? Now, don't hear this. Okay, I'm just not going to make any claims. And then I can live however I want. And nobody has to worry about calling me out. I can just do whatever I want. I can just walk my walk. I don't have to worry about it being different than what I say. L let me just do that. But, but no. See, we should be a people who are bold in our declaration of the life that we want to live. And we should be bold enough to tell the people around us what it is we are, we are called to. We should be people who, who want our actions to, to back up the claims that we're making. We want to have the opportunity to confess and repent and continue to see Jesus sanctify us as the people in our lives would actually call out sin and help us walk with God, that we would actually have fellowship with the church and with God. See, one of the joys of, of baptizing people as a church is, is we get to hear these public declarations, right? At Easter, we had four baptisms of, of these different people claiming to be wanting to follow Jesus now. 
It would be completely strange if you saw any of those four people in the next few weeks out in public doing something that looked like walking in the darkness. It it would It would be strange because you had just heard this claim that they have made what are you doing? Your, your life isn't living up to the, the claim you've made. It would be even worse for us as, as a church if we saw this and we ignored them, we, we wrote them off, we ignored them, we, we looked down on them rather than reminding them of the fellowship that they claim to continue to walk in that light, to repent from what they're doing and to love God more fully. There are those who, who call themselves Christians. There are those who think they're part of the church and then teach that they can live however they want to, with whatever license, licentiousness, do, doing whatever they want, and yet they're still right with, with God. The claim is that grace will provide forgiveness, and I don't need to worry about what I do anymore. I've been made right with God. I can live however I want now. But Paul's message in, in Romans, Romans 6, where he says, by, by no means, we, we, we cannot continue this life any longer, or in, in 1 Peter, where he calls us to live a holy life as, as God is holy, or here in John's letter, we see the apostles in complete agreement. We cannot claim to walk in the light and yet still walk in darkness. It can't happen. Now, this is hard truth for us because I don't know if you look in the mirror or you look around, but I know that I see still sin in my life. I know that I don't walk perfectly every day. I know that there are still areas of my life that I struggle to trust God with and I struggle to be obedient in. Next week we're going to look at this passage, but there is good news for us in this too. John continues, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but... If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We need to be made right with God, justified by the blood of Jesus. We need to continue to confess our sin and follow him, but we don't have to worry if we are, we're trying to follow him, that un, unconfessed sin or unrepentant sin, if we die, somehow we're lost. But there's a difference between walking in the darkness and still having sin that we're trying to learn to put to death. What do you claim? What do you practice? The warning is very simple. If this is our lifestyle of one foot in the light, one foot in the dark, we lie. We do not practice the truth. We're living in the darkness, and in the darkness there is no hope. That's the first claim. The second claim, verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. The second claim, I think, is almost worse than the first. The first claim at least says, like, I I know what sin is, I'm just choosing to have a hard heart towards it. And and, and hopefully, as you're surrounded by the church, you can get called out, and that people would be able to walk with you and and call out the sin that is so evident in your life. But the second claim to say, we we have no sin at all, is, is more dangerous because you're deceived. You actually believe you have no sin, you have nothing to be forgiven of. The conversation is terrifying. We have fellowship with God. No, no, you're, you're walking in sin. You, you need to repent. You need to turn. You need to trust in Jesus to, to forgive your sins. Sin? I have no sin that we need to forgive. It, it's, it's all good. What hope does someone who's been deceived of the seriousness of sin have? It's like trying to confront a person who has an addiction. There's, there's something there that they, they cannot see past. They're comfortable with their addiction. They, they love it. It's comforting. It, it, it brings them what they need. You're, you're, you're trying to convince them of something that they are already convinced of the opposite. And no matter how much you tell them the addiction is, is hurting them and, and killing them, no matter how much you plead, they can't hear because they're deceived and their hearts are hardened towards that truth. When we look at that that list of ways that John is calling out those who are walking in the darkness, put it back up there, the people who don't keep God's commandments, who don't walk like Jesus, who hate their brothers, who love the world, 
who have not maintained fellowship with the church, who deny that Jesus is the Christ. If these kind of activities are happening in your life, and you can't call them sin, see them as sin, how great is the deception that has taken hold? I can tell you right now, it's not something that is just out there and, and something that is unique. We've met with and we've prayed with and we've discipled and we've count, uh, counseled endless people who we have tried to convince of their sin that they have stopped being in fellowship with the church or that they are not walking with Jesus, that they are living in rebellion to God, but they can't see it. The thing is, if, if, if we start to claim that we walk with God, but we're actually walking in darkness, that's the first step to actually being fully deceived of our sin, of it becoming the thing that gives us our identity and our worth and our value. It starts young, and it can last all the way until the very end of our lives. Uh, the other day, as, as our kids were biking, um, one of them fell off his, his bike and was crying, and so we went over, and he was screaming at one of his siblings about how his sibling had hit him from behind, and he had caused him to fall off his bike. Well, the sibling, who clearly had done something because uh, they were standing there with that look on their face trying to figure out how do I lie? Uh, how, how am I so sure that I did nothing wrong? And you see it. It wasn't my fault. They stopped. They stopped too quickly. I, I couldn't get out of the way. I, it, it was their fault. They turned really fast. And it wasn't just then. I, I caught them with candy in one of the bunk beds and I, I pointed out and said, yeah, this isn't what we do. And my, my one child was very excited to say that it was his sister's fault. <laughs> and then my daughter was very excited to say, you were eating candy too, not as much as you. <laughs> it is really easy to be deceived by sin. It is really easy for us to try to justify and make it seem like not that big of a deal. To, to not listen to the truths of the apostles of, of what God is trying to tell us and speak into our lives. Those who are deceived, who believe they have no sin, have ceased to see sin the way the Bible does. The way the apostles have passed it on to us, that, that we've received from Jesus, that, that God has attested to in the Old Testament. Because there are those who finally see their sin who will call themselves, like Paul, the, the, the greatest of sinners, the chief of sinners. Even though this would be a man who is being sanctified and made more and more into the image of God, who can even say, follow me as I follow Jesus. And yet he knows that there is still sin, that there has been sin that needs to be dealt with. The reason we start off with, with God as light is to reveal the character of God, yes, but as we look at the character of God and we look at our walk, we look at our claims, the hope is that we would be shocked to see our own inadequacy, to stand up before his perfection. We would be embarrassed by the self-righteousness that we cling to and that we would be humbled to turn from our sin and to trust in God alone to save. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. It's one thing to lie, but it's another thing to be completely deceived and unable to see the truth at all. There's no way that we can claim the truth of the gospel, that, that God is, is dwelling in us through the Holy Spirit, that we have been forgiven of sin and yet claim that but walk in sin every single day. And whether John is speaking of sin that's, that's ours as a sin of Adam that's been imputed to us, whether he's speaking of a, of a new Christian who, who understands that they've been justified, they've been made right with God by the blood of Jesus, and, and now they don't think they have to keep confessing, or, or whether it's the Christian who's been living a long time with Jesus and, and is just ignoring sin in their life. They're not confessing and trying to continue to turn away from it to follow Jesus more fully. The answer is the same. We continue to have sin in our lives that needs to be repented of so that we can follow Jesus more fully.
that we can look more and more like him. We're self-deceived if we believe we have no sin. And we cannot be in fellowship with Jesus if we claim to no longer need his grace. Romans 3.23 makes it very clear. All of us are sinners, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 tells us the consequence of it. The wages of sin is death. God has made a very clear proclamation. And for us to reject it and to deceive ourselves, to live in a lie, doesn't change the future. We cannot claim ignorance. God's proclamation over us is that we are sinners condemned and hopeless if left to ourselves. So what will you proclaim about your own walk? What what will you proclaim about your life? Are you walking in the light, continuing to turn from sin, or are you walking in the darkness, loving it more than you love Jesus? If we see that God is light, it should reveal the great darkness that is inside of us, the sin that condemns us before a holy God. But here's the good news of the passage. Look at verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. Here's the final point and the declaration that I am calling all of us to make yet again today. The saving proclamation is this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. The sinful proclamations all started with, if you say, and they were just empty words. The saving proclamation starts with, if you confess your sins. And now you might say, Tim, you sound kind of dumb. Those are all just words. If you confess, it's just speaking. And if you say something, it's just speaking. But what John is doing here is he's saying more than just, it's not just words. The act of confession is the act of bringing everything we have before a holy God. Our sins are coming before him with us and we are laying them down before them, presenting them to God and seeking forgiveness. It is an action that we actually do. It is a life changing. It is a heart changing. It is a directional change. It is stopping to do what we want, how we want, and it is choosing to submit ourselves, to humble ourselves before God. Confess our sins. This is the call for all of us. This is the thing that we are all supposed to declare, that we would come before a holy God and seek forgiveness that only he can give. It's not just talk, it's it's action. And so if we see that spiritual death is claiming to be without sin, then spiritual life is claiming to be filled with sin, but proclaiming saving faith in Jesus alone. What does this look like? you might ask. What would it, what would it look like to, to finally understand that we're sinners in, in need of God's grace? Well, you can read about the life of, of Paul, a self-righteous Jewish man, part of the Pharisaical group, an, an Israelite who had done everything according to the law in his own mind. He was blameless and upright so much so that he hated the church and the Christians because, well, they weren't doing it the right way. They, they weren't following God properly. This Jesus wasn't who they were supposed to be following. And so he went from town to town, putting people in prison and beating them and putting them to death until one day on the road, he experienced a great light. Jesus revealed himself to Paul and he blinded him showing his own inadequacy, his own sin, his own self-righteousness. Yet it was this experience that drew him to finally confessing and repenting and going on to serving God with his whole life. That he would be willing to suffer and be beaten and stoned and shipwrecked and to go ultimately to his death, proclaiming the good news that Jesus saves. Or maybe something uh, closer to home. I I came across uh, a a story about uh, a man who grew up in a Christian home, attended a gospel preaching church, confessed faith at an early uh, early age, and was even uh, serving in the church, worship ministry, youth ministry. But over the years, 
he allowed sin to enter into his life. He was, he was okay with a, a little bit of, of hidden sin that grew and grew and grew until it was no longer hidden sin and it was all out rebellion. And people in the church tried to call him on his sin, tried to stop him, tried, tried to plead with him to repent and to turn. And then he wouldn't. And finally, the church actually exercised church discipline on him. They, they told him, we can no longer have you in fellowship with us. You're, you're no longer a brother to us. You, you cannot be here if you claim this life but you're living this. And in his deception, he, he walked away from the church and he chose for years to follow after his lustful desires in every way. And yet it was after his, his father died that he was invited to come back to a church. And when he came back to a church, uh, the, the church started to speak the gospel over him. He, he actually disclosed that he was still in church discipline from his old church, but that didn't stop them from trying to steward his soul and walk with him and help him to put sin to death. He moved in with some Christian brothers and he started living life with them. He started uh, turning away from the sin that ruled in his heart. And, and ultimately, over months and months and months, began to have victory over his sin. It came to the point where he, he was outwardly repentant and inwardly repentant for, for 10 months. And he got to this place where he, he still wasn't sure if he was changed. He, he still felt so burdened by his sin. And it, and it was when meeting with an elder, as he was talking about how, how horrible he was, how sinful he was, how broken he was, how much he needed God's grace, but he didn't deserve it, that, that the elder finally stopped him and, and, and said, it, it sounds like what you're describing is true repentance. I'm going to recommend you for membership to the church. When he was brought back in, he said, the words fell with the effect of a grace bomb. Doubts diminished, hope flooded my heart. I could see so clearly that my efforts could never save me. In fact, God had been at work in spite of me. By his grace, this man was brought back in. The, the light needed to shine in to, to show the deep effects of sin in his life. See, the good news for, for all of us is that we can admit we're sinful people, we're, we're bad people, and yet there's a holy God who loves us so much so that he sent his son to die on the cross for us. See, unless we claim to be sinners, Jesus' death is not on our behalf. If we don't confess our sin, God cannot be faithful and just to forgive them. In fact, it would be an affront to his character and to his holiness for him to forgive sins that have not been confessed and repented of. And yet, what this passage says is more than anything, God's character, his heart is to forgive sin. He is drawing us and, and welcoming us. He's revealing sin in our hearts not to make us feel bad, to make us see our need for him to forgive them and to make us pure before him. This is an invitation and a reminder for all of us. We have a faithful and just God who forgives any who come to him in confession and repentance. Those are people who are made justified, made right with him. And yet, even in our walk for the rest of our lives, as we see sin in our life, we want to continue to, to confess it and to repent from it because we want to walk with the one who saved us, who's redeemed us, who's bought us back with his very blood. So confess your sins often and freely. Do it in all seriousness, but with freedom, knowing that the only way to have fellowship with God, to walk in the light, is to bring everything into the light. If you've heard this, this bad news, this, this good news today, but you're still maybe unbelieving that you're a sinner, that you, you have sin that needs to be confessed and repented of, there's one final warning that our passage gives. Uh, look at verse 10 with me. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. The final place we go to is when we claim to be without sin, we are directly attacking who God is and what he said, what he has claimed. When we start doing that, there, there is there's no hope. But I think you're actually here today because someone loves you and has drawn you to this place. 
you may not see it like that, but you're here because God has drawn you to this place today. Like a, like a good family member who cares for, for someone in their family who's sick. You know, somebody who, who won't admit that they have a problem, who, who won't admit that something is, is wrong with their, their body. But this, this, this family member sees it and they're, they're trying to plead with you and they're, they're trying to say, like, come, come with me to the doctor. Come and be made well. But the only way that we can be made well is if we actually confess, if we actually admit that there is a problem that we have that we can't fix ourselves. The only way for the doctor to give us a, an appropriate diagnosis and treatment is for us to lay it all out before them. This is the call for all of us today. The only way for there to be healing is if we confess our sins to the healer who is faithful and just. He will forgive us our sins, purify us from all unrighteousness, and we can walk in fellowship with him. That is the call today. So the question is, what is your proclamation? What will you declare to be true of you, and what will you walk out Don't leave this place today without talking to someone. If there's even a hint that you are walking in darkness, do not leave this place without talking to one of us, without somebody around you, without coming forward for prayer. The invitation is that we can walk in the light as he is in the light and have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus' son cleanses us from all sin. Would you pray with me to that end for all of us? Jesus, You have freely given grace to those who come to you. God, it's a gift that we can't buy, we can't earn. It is only given by you. And God, I pray that as we have heard your words today, that as we've heard this passage of scripture speak into our hearts, that God, we would actually come to the place where we confess sin, all of it, God, there will be nothing that we want to hold back because we want to walk in the light with you. And God, we know that as long as we hold on to darkness, as long as we hold on to sin, as long as we love it more than we love you, God, we can't walk fully with you. Jesus, convict us of our sin and help us to be free of it. Help us to come before you and lay them at your feet, asking you to forgive and cleanse us. Jesus, work in our hearts. Open our eyes. We pray this in your great name, Jesus. Amen.